it's great to meet together this morning. I want to start by reading um, Psalm 100. So let, let's hear, let's hear God's words together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. So that's a wonderful psalm, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we can remember, can't we, that the Lord is God, we're his sheep, he is our shepherd. We can come to him with thankfulness. There's always something to thank the Lord for. And it says that the Lord is good. His steadfast love keeps on going. God loves us. God continues to care for us. God continues to be with us. And this morning, I'm sure he wants to encourage us as we draw near to him, as we have this time of fellowship with one another the lord is with us and although we can't sing wholeheartedly and we can't enjoy being physically together we can enjoy the lord's presence so i trust and i believe this morning god will draw near to each one of us as we draw near to him i'll just pray and then we're going to hear some worship music um, so let's pray together Heavenly Father, you know us, you love us, you are with us. And we pray that this morning you would encourage our hearts. Lord, as we draw near to you, would you draw near to us? We pray for those who are not with us this morning. We pray for your blessing and your presence to be with them. So, Father, be with us now, we ask, as we draw near in faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So let's let's have our worship. Well, good morning, everybody. And um, our music is going to be recorded today uh, just for to make it uh, easier for us to join in and sing. So we're going to start off with praise is rising, hearts are turning to you. Thank you, Ian, for uh, encouraging us and bringing us together uh, with our reading. So let's join together, let's worship and praise him uh, now. Jesus. 
Hosanna, you are the one who saves us. He's a wonderful saviour, is our God. Rachel is now going to, uh, to share with us. Um, as you'll know, it's been uh, the Keswick week uh, with a difference. And, and Rachel's just going to share um, how, it's, how virtually Keswick has, uh, has been for, uh, for her. And then she's going to lead us in prayer after that. So over to Rachel. Oh. Morning. Um, yeah, so as, as many of you know, most years, uh, for the last number of years, um, Chris and I and the family have been up to Keswick and helped as part of the K4K, uh, Keswick for Kids team. Um, but obviously the convention was cancelled this year. So it's been a bit like, uh, feels a bit like we've been on furlough from Keswick this year. So, so what we've been able to do is actually to uh, really benefit from the ministry that um, has been put on over the last week as part of Virtually Keswick. So there's been a whole programme of events and I know some people have um, tuned in and, and watched, um, but there's there's been Bible readings every morning, working through uh, Psalms 2 to 6, uh, which have been led by Christopher Ash, um, just wonderful Bible teacher and really encouraging to look at where we can find hope. So the whole theme of, of Virtually Keswick has been hope which is really appropriate for this current time that we find ourselves in, isn't it? Um, you know, where we can find hope in times of uncertainty, um, in times of challenge, when things seem to be going wrong. You know, we can find our hope in Jesus, in ourselves. Uh, we are nothing and, and we, we can't find that hope in and of ourselves. But if we turn to Jesus, we can find that hope there. But I, I would just encourage you, if you have a chance, it's um, the materials all available on the Virtually Keswick website. Um, there's the, the Bible reading talks, which go through Psalms, as I said. There's um, the evening celebrations. Um, there's also the Keswick Youth Stream, which the boys have really enjoyed being part of. Um, and also um, Keswick for Kids have put together uh, Hope Hunters, which is five sessions. Um, looking at where we can find hope again looking through the psalm so just if you get a chance it's it's been really nice to still be part of keswick um and to just have that opportunity to to really feed on his word um through that so just really good opportunity to um you know if you've not had a chance to catch up just sit down with the brew and and uh, maybe have a chance to catch up but just a verse from psalm 5 before we pray. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Just that reminder that it is in Jesus where we find our refuge and our hope. And it's Jesus who puts his protection over us um, that we can rejoice in him. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that. Uh, you've given us Jesus and you've given us that hope in Jesus that we can have hope in uncertain times, hope when things go wrong, that we can find hope in salvation that comes through Jesus' death on the cross, Lord, and that we have a, a hope um, in heaven, Lord, knowing where our future lies. Thank you that, that 
we can find that as we read your word and can be encouraged by your word, Father. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of Keswick that has been able to continue this year, albeit in a very different way. And just thank you for that opportunity to um, receive from your word, Lord, and to be encouraged and built up. Lord, and just pray that you would help us as your people here in Barn Oldswick to build each other up at this time. Lord, to, to find hope in you, Lord, and to just encourage each other in the hope that we have because he who gives it is faithful to his Lord. Amen. Thank you, Rachel, for, uh, for sharing and for leading us in prayer. We're going to sing again, and we're going to sing of uh, his mercy, which is far greater and far abounding than anything we could imagine uh, or ask for. And it's his mercy that brings us peace with God and gives us hope for a future with him. So let's sing together, his mercy is more. What love could we remember, no wrongs we have done, oh missing to know. Thank you again for your grace and your mercy for the fact that while we were still sinners, yet Christ died for us. Lord, thank you. You give us a hope and a future so that regardless of the situation we even find ourselves in now, Lord, we know that one day we will be in a place which there will be no more hurt, no more sickness, no more death and a hope to come. And so we pray now for, uh, for Connor as he brings your word to us lord we pray that you would open our hearts to receive it open our ears to hear what you are saying open our minds to understand the things of yourself we pray you are blessed connor as he shares with us now in jesus name we ask amen okay right well it's uh it's really good to be back it's really good to see faces again uh um, and it's it's really been a wonderful time the past three weeks uh, with me and Naomi have had a really lovely 
wedding and honeymoon and all that. So thank you, everyone, um, for your well wishes and your gifts and cards and things like that. Um, we both really, really are thankful for everybody. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, here we are again, unfortunately, frustratingly, uh, despite us moving forward, we're back on Zoom. And uh, But all we can do is just uh, carry the show on and uh, we'll just use this time wisely to go into God's word together and make use of the time wisely. Yeah? So we'll see what God wants to speak to us through this passage. Now we're continuing our journey through Acts and we're just up to Acts chapter 4 uh, and it's just the last little section in the, uh, from 32 to 37 and it says the believers share their possessions. Reading from the NIV. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their position, possessions was their own but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. And Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Well, that's the reading. Now, the title that I had in that NRV for the section, if you're reading from there, was The Believers Share Their Possessions. But if you have a different translation you might be reading, it might also say they had everything in common which I think maybe could be closer to the point of what Luke's trying to describe to us here than the state of this early church. It tells us that the believers were in this state of comprehensive unity. It says they were of one heart and one mind. Or if you read in a different translation, again, it might say one heart and one soul. For the word here for mind also translates as soul, depending on the context in the Bible. And John Wesley, the famous preacher, once said in his writings here about this passage that their loves, their hopes, and their passions were joined together. This, Luke says, is the state of a healthy church. And what united the church here wasn't just merely a, a common affiliation uh, with a church. They were united spiritually. They were united by a passionate commitment to a mission, which was to begin to build God's kingdom on earth. So this inevitably resulted in them extending out and serving one another. Everyone who had property didn't necessarily hold on to it as though it were theirs. They saw their property and their possessions and their money as gifts from God. Uh, so they just simply wanted to share that with each other as God's family. It says there were no needy people among them. Now notice here it's still referring to the church community. We're not to be confused. We are to replicate this in our own church society, of course. It's not intended though, I don't think, in this prescription as a general prescription for, for society as a whole. Because only when we can achieve these things in our own communities and in our own households, do we then stand any chance of being able to achieve anything outside of there in the wider world around us? And then maybe we can influence the culture around us to join us or to imitate us in that way. The famous uh, internet figure and psychologist, uh, Jordan B. Peterson says, if you, you can't try to clean up the mess in the world if you cannot clean up your own room. And Paul says similar things in 1 Timothy chapter 3 when he's giving qualifications for leaders in the church. He says that leaders in the church must manage their own households well. For if someone does not know how to manage their own household, how is he going to care for God's church? This is exactly what we see from Barnabas, don't we? In this passage, he's already, before 
you know, is known for traveling with Paul. He's busy giving and donating to the church, selling proceeds, and clearly has got a name for himself for encouraging people in the faith. They give him the name Barnabas, which isn't his real name, means son of encouragement, which is just an ancient way of saying the one who encourages. Therefore, due to his competence in being able to encourage his fellow believers, he's later, as we read further on in Acts, chosen by Paul to accompany him on his missionary journeys out into the world. Christians love to use this, these kinds of passages to, as a call to activism, to go out into the community, a megaphone to march out and to attempt to resolve all the world's suffering and injustices. But although, of course, this is a noble cause, um, God wants us, I think, to just, you know, slow down. You know, let's not run before we can walk. How well are we serving our own church community, our own brothers and sisters? Yes, we may feed the poor. That's great. But what good is that if you don't even treat your own wife or husband with love and patience and respect? You might feel dead virtuous for giving to the homeless, but yet you show no concern for the elderly church member who is widowed and is lonely. You know, let's, let's be consistent. Um, and let's not get carried away with our good intentions for the wider world and neglect those closest to us, like a horse with its blinkers on, just going for one goal, but missing all those things that are closest to us. We also need to make sure we don't mistake this passage as some sort of ancient utopian society. This is a healthy church, I do agree with that, but it's, it's definitely an imperfect one. We see in the very next chapter, if you keep reading, that we have this very serious incident with Ananias and Sapphira. And in the very next chapter after that, we get the Hellenic Jews that are grumbling about unequal distribution of food and things in Acts chapter 6. This is why it's really important for us to read our Bibles effectively, which means to read more of it and not just read the verse here and there. We need to read the Bible as it was written, which was in a much more wholesome uh, compiled document. So we need to read it more. We need to read it properly. And if we do then we'll see here that, of course, this isn't a description of a utopian society at all. And church can be healthy. You know, disagreements isn't a bad sign in church. And actually, it can be healthy to a degree. We can challenge one another, can't we, to grow and to learn. And it's certainly not any kind of endorsement of a particular government system or a political social justice movement, as many have used this passage as a proof text for within politics. As a dis, uh, some think this is a perfect description of effective socialism, communism, those kinds of ideas, and twist it to defend their own political allegiances. But this is about a community of people who are choosing willingly to give of their own volition freely and spontaneously. The state isn't anywhere in sight here they're not compelled by law to do so this is a community in their spiritual who in their spiritual unity are compelled by the holy spirit to share the gospel as it says that the uh, apostles preached and no doubt others were evangelizing with the communities as well because it says in verse 33 god's grace was powerfully working in them all and they were also compelled, not by law, but the Holy Spirit, to share their money, to share their possessions with the community, brothers and sisters, which ultimately welcomed people of all walks of life and attracted multitudes by the day in that time. This is not an instruction to start a political revolution or an endorsement of some kind of political social reform. This is uh, something that is pressurizing us in our culture today, I do find. And many political movements, both in ancient and recent history, have sounded promising with their so-called intentions, with their slogans and their rhetoric. Um, essentially, with their goal being to establish some kind of earthly paradise, something a bit like you hear John Lennon singing in Imagine, 
eradicating all inequality, poverty, injustice. But what John Lennon didn't seem to understand is that that had been attempted multiple times. And, uh, and as though it was some sort of attempt to create a new heavens and new earth before Jesus Christ's return. Which should, to us as Christians, as followers of God's word, should alarm us straight away because God promises no such society as being achievable before the day of the Lord. So unsurprisingly, each attempt at this has shown its true worldliness and has fallen and it's caused unspeakable devastation and suffering and death. Such socialist Marxism and uh, communism in the 20th century was the cause of 85 to 100 million deaths in the 20th century in countries such as China, Russia, Cambodia. It makes the number of deaths in the Holocaust, um, which is uh, between six and 10 million altogether, look quite tame by comparison. And most of these ideologies, you know, try to lure the church in with their ideas. You know, let's create this perfect society and use the Bible to justify their actions. But the true believing church had to keep its distance, holding firm to the simplicity and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and knowing that they have to obey God rather than any movement of man. If we use Jesus's principle of you can judge a tree by the fruit that it bears, we can see what movements and what ideas are of God or of man or of even the devil what is the fruit of this current political climate you might ask regarding identity politics intersectionality and so on and so forth well from my perspective i see division i see hostility i see a pretty merciless uh, cancellation of people who make mistakes or who dare to disagree and I see a hatred of God and his word and his people as a result as well as uh, sparking mass anxiety and deranged behavior um, and even violence uh, in certain places it's it's even causing conflict within God's community of believers right now I do think these ideas are trying to invade the church and as a masquerade in as some sort of upgrade on the current way of doing things. And I think it really can deceive us as believers because we, we desire to do justice, don't we? We desire to do good and we want to think that we're doing good things in society. But to use uh, computer terminology, you know, they may be saying that they're some sort of computer update, but this information is no system update. It's malware. And we need to be really careful not to download this information and try and open it in the church or it may well crash the system. We can be assured that any ideas or any movements that cause division and disunity within the body of Christ is a hallmark sign of the work of the devil. It's a telltale sign. And such things have been happening even within our own church here in Barn Oldswick. Such problems are going on. You, re you can really tell a tree by its fruit. So we just need to be really, really careful not to be deceived. We need to be really alert to these things. Because these ideas are being Trojan host into our communities, into our lives, claiming to fight for equality. But they don't want your sympathy and they don't want your support. They want submission and they want power. And we cannot submit to any other authority than that of our Lord Jesus Christ. So my concluding thought is this. If we want true equality, if we want so social justice, if we want a unified community like we see here in Acts, we must look to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. There is a, a proverb from the Bible that says, there is a way that seems right to man, but it leads to death. And this is a really stark warning, I think, for our culture as a whole. 
because our Western culture is inherently Judeo-Christian, whether people know it or not, in its deepest roots and values and its mores. Nothing bef before the biblical tradition in ancient culture, nothing stood up for people's individual rights, regardless of class, color or sex. The very idea that people are all equal in the eyes of God and deserve to be treated as so is unequivocally biblical. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. You'll find zero historical writings from antiquity, whether it be laws, philosophy, anything else that give as much value and worth to every human being as you find in the pages of the Bible. In the eyes of all the ancients, uh, in every culture, people by very nature, some people just the way they're born, are prostitutes, are slaves, are poor. The only thing in history that said any different was Yahweh, was Yahweh incarnate in his son in Jesus Christ, who it says made mankind in his own image. And therefore, by definition, every single person has dignity and worth, be not because of what we do, not because of where we come from, not because of what oppressed group we belong to, but because of what we are. No other system of beliefs asserts this. And modern naturalism and atheism cannot defend this view of human beings either. I do admit that without God, we can still know to some extent anyway, right from wrong, um, morally speaking, and are capable of acts of kindness. But unfortunately, on such a system of unbelief, it's impossible to answer why we ought to do so. Why? How can we objectively say that we as human beings ought to live or ought not to live this way or that way without God's law? We can't. Without a moral creator, without a standard of morality and justice outside of ourselves and that's greater than ourselves, we cannot have a functional society. We cannot have a unified society, period. Everyone will do what is right in their own eyes and ultimately will be justified in doing so. The very notion of justice without God's law, which defines the worth of human beings, is totally baseless. Justice, equality, love, grace, forgiveness come through the Lord. And only when we accept Jesus wholly and limitlessly as Lord of our lives, do we truly know a God who loves his creation and can guide us in what real justice and unity is. And I think I do truly believe that our culture is starting to slowly realize that their godlessness cannot satisfy them. So we must really be in prayer that that truth can break through before our culture slowly self-destructs. I'll just close in prayer. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for political peace and protection for people and your church. In times like this, we need to work together harmoniously, not turn against one another. And Lord, we pray for a unity among God's church during this time to lead as examples and not to get drawn into the latest trends that culture forces down our throats. But we pray it holds fast to the truth of Jesus Christ and his good news, which stands for all time. All things fade and pass away, Lord, but your word stands forever. Give us hearts uh, of love and patience and giving service for those closest to us. And then so we can go on into our communities to bear with vulnerable people during these difficult times. All this ultimately is for your glory and for your honour, Lord. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Connor, for your word and for um, a message. We pray, Lord Jesus, that that message would be found a resting place in our home, in our hearts. Uh, and Lord, help us to grasp the wonder of yourself. I think it's important uh, that we do watch out for, for things, uh, especially in these days of isolation, the church not coming together uh, physically. Um, it's, it's so easy for ideas and, and things to, to really get hold of our minds and our thinking. And so thank you there, Connor. You know, that it's important that we don't get the virus. Recently, I had on my computer uh, something that managed to, to get my email address. And as a result of that, it started sending out random emails to people. And uh, I was getting random messages from my friends. They were saying, have you sent me this dodgy email? It looks, it doesn't look like you. It, it, you know, it had my name attached to it, but it wasn't from me. And we've got to watch out that situations like that don't come into the church. Unity comes through Jesus Christ. It's his kingdom that's been built. And so in response to what we've been hearing, we're going to sing that song, Build Your Kingdom Here. I know it's one that we've been singing quite a lot recently, but it's such an important thing. Uh, that we should be praying and seeking that God will build his kingdom through our church, through our lives, so that we have that glorious message to share. Um, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. That was a, a phrase, that was a, a word that was coming through my mind as he was speaking. And, you know, we've got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep looking at his word, keep reading, keep praising, keep giving thanks. Because, you know, this isn't where we finish. There is a kingdom yet to come. There is a kingdom where, you know, where everything is going to be as it should be. We're not there yet. We're living in this, not now, now but not yet time. There's going to come a time when that kingdom will be restored. So let's sing, let's sing together. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in as we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now we are your church and we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captive hearts release the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause and we are your church and we pray revive this earth Kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom. your kingdom's power reaching the near and far no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts you made us for much more than this awake the kingdom seed in us fill us with the strength and love of church and we are the hope on earth build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand 
darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire win this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here we pray um, let's pray together um, I do believe you know God is the one that can change things and Jesus said he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it and we must keep our focus there you know it's so tempting to be diverted onto other issues you know, we watch our TVs and we engage with the media and we can so easily be drawn into other agendas. Let's stay with Jesus. Let's stay with his mandate, with his call. And um, if we follow him, he will resolve issues. He will help us. He will lead us. He will build us. He will build his church. And uh, thank you, Connor, for calling us back to God's ways and God's word. So let, let's just pray right now that, that God may strengthen us and help us and encourage us to stay close to him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you preside over an ever-increasing kingdom. Lord, thank you that your kingdom is, is heaven's best idea. And heaven's plan is that we follow our Lord Jesus Christ. And that, Lord, you form us into communities and families and churches that may yield to you and follow you and love you and worship you. And that, Lord, from this, you may cause us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And yet, Lord, we've heard today that this all begins in our own hearts, in our own families. Lord, strengthen us to be the kinds of people that you would have us be in these days. Lord, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, we pray. Lord, enable us to meditate on your word and make us to be the kind of community you would have us be in these days. Lord, as we come out of lockdown, Father, we may be your true witnesses in this dark world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.